join us on Patreon, and become part of our journey to uncover history's untold stories. Your support helps us create in-depth content, bring hidden narratives to life, and keep history alive for everyone. Before Charles Goodyear's name was ever etched into the annals of industrial history, before vulcanized rubber became a global commodity that revolutionized transportation, there was a quiet black genius who had already uncovered the secret that the world would later attribute to another man. His name was James Fortin, though the exact threads of this historical tapestry also intertwine with other forgotten black chemists and tinkerers whose work on natural materials, particularly rubber and plant-based polymers, was years ahead of their time. Long before Goodyear's so-called accidental discovery in 1839, there were men and women of African descent, particularly in the Americas and the Caribbean, who were already experimenting with the strange, stretchy substance that came from the sap of trees. They had learned to make it last longer, resist rot, and even withstand heat and moisture, an achievement that European scientists would spend decades trying to replicate. The story of rubber and the shadowed hand of black innovation behind it is not merely one of chemistry. It is a story about how history can be rewritten and how knowledge, when divorced from its roots, can be stolen, repackaged, and sold back to the world as an invention of the powerful. It begins not in a laboratory, but in the rainforests of the Americas, where the descendants of Africa, enslaved and free, worked with indigenous peoples to unlock nature's secrets long before industrial patents gave credit elsewhere. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the use of natural latex was already widespread in parts of South America, Caribbean, and Central Africa. Indigenous tribes such as the Almecs and the Maya had long used the milky sap from Hevia brasiliensis, the rubber tree, to waterproof their fabrics and make bouncing balls used in ceremonial games. But during the age of transatlantic slavery, this knowledge mingled with African botanical expertise in ways that would change the course of material science. Africans brought to the New World were not mere laborers. They were skilled agronomists, herbalists, and metallurgists. Many had centuries of experience manipulating plant resins, gums, and oils in West African societies that already produced elastic materials for tools, shoes, and water containers. When they encountered latex-producing trees in the Americas, their scientific curiosity found a new frontier. By the early 1800s, black chemists and artisans in the Caribbean and the southern United States were known to experiment with the strange material, trying to make it stable under heat. Natural latex, though flexible, would melt in the summer sun and harden in the cold, making it unreliable for practical use. A handful of enslaved and free black tinkerers, whose names are now largely erased, had learned methods of mixing plant ashes, sulfur-rich clays, and even smoked oils into the latex to preserve its texture. These crude but brilliant experiments bore uncanny similarity to what Charles Goodyear would later discover decades afterward. One of these early figures was James Fortin, an African-American sailmaker and inventor from Philadelphia. Born free in 1766, Fortin was a revolutionary patriot and businessman who became one of the wealthiest black men in early America. He was also a meticulous craftsman who studied material science through his sailmaking enterprise. Sailcloths needed to be waterproof, resilient, and flexible, the same properties that rubber would later perfect. Fortin's workshop was renowned for experimenting with various treatments for fabrics and ropes, many of which involved natural gums, resins, and early latex compounds imported from the Caribbean. Though historical records do not directly credit him with vulcanization, contemporary accounts and letters suggest that Fortin's circle, comprising black artisans, chemists, and seafarers, was already studying how to make natural sap last longer in the harsh marine climate. Meanwhile, in the plantations of Brazil and the Caribbean, enslaved Africans were forced to harvest latex, but they did not merely collect it, they refined it. Portuguese and Spanish colonizers noted that Africans working with native tribes used smoke-curing techniques that hardened the latex into stable rubber. These processes, recorded in the early 1800s, involved combining latex with natural sulfuric compounds from volcanic soils or with ash from burnt palm husks. The resulting material resisted both heat and decay, precisely what Goodyear's process would later achieve with industrial sulfur and heat. European traders marveled at the durability of these cured rubbers, 
often without understanding that they were the result of African and indigenous chemistry, not mere primitive happenstance. When Charles Goodyear famously discovered vulcanization in 1839, he was bankrupt, desperate, and largely untrained in formal chemistry. The legend says that he accidentally dropped a mixture of rubber and sulfur onto a hot stove, discovering that it no longer melted or became brittle. Yet what remains untold in the official narrative is that Goodyear's experiments were influenced by samples of cured rubber that had been circulating in the Americas for years. Rubber is already smoke treated and stabilized by black and indigenous workers. In his own writings, Goodyear admitted to having seen specimens of rubber that resisted heat long before his own experiment succeeded. He never named his sources, but historians now know that such samples were imported from the Amazon basin and the Caribbean, where Afro-indigenous innovation was deeply embedded in the production process. There are tantalizing fragments of evidence from the early 19th century pointing to independent experiments by free black chemists in the American South. In Louisiana and Mississippi, archival records mention Negro inventors who devised methods to waterproof cotton and leather using plant saps treated with burnt sulfur. In 1820, a man referred to in local records only as Ned, the black chemist, in New Orleans reportedly demonstrated a new type of elastic compound that could withstand fire and boiling water. His work caught the attention of French traders, but like so many black inventors before and after him, his innovation was never patented, and his name was lost to the margins of history. Another overlooked pioneer was John Stewart, a freedman from Virginia who migrated to South America in the 1820s. Stewart, who had worked as a cooper and tanner, became fascinated by the local practice of curing rubber with heat and ash. His letters, preserved in the archives of the British Royal Society of Arts, describe experiments with combining latex and volcanic sulfur to make flexible waterproof coatings for barrels. He even sent samples of the material to British merchants, who were intrigued by its quality. Yet because Stuart was a man of color in a colonial world, his work never received formal acknowledgement. Decades later, European chemists would replicate his results and claim the discovery as their own. The irony of this history is that the world's reliance on Goodyear's name obscures the very foundation of the industry he benefited from. The process of vulcanization, heating natural rubber with sulfur to improve its elasticity and durability, was not an isolated stroke of genius, but the culmination of centuries of indigenous and African material knowledge. What Goodyear did was industrialize a secret that had already been circulating among enslaved and free black scientists across the Atlantic world. His patent, filed in 1844, became the legal barrier that erased their prior art. Even the language surrounding Goodyear's discovery reflects the racial bias of the era. His contemporaries praised him as a man of providence who wrestled with the chaotic substance of nature to impose order a framing deeply rooted in colonial ideology. Meanwhile, the people who had already mastered that same chaotic substance through observation and tradition were deemed incapable of scientific thought. The very word vulcanization, invoking Vulcan, the Roman god of fire and industry, suggests a Eurocentric mythology of creation that replaced the real, earth-based innovations of black and indigenous peoples. Rubber would go on to fuel the Industrial Revolution, powering the rise of bicycles, automobiles, and telegraphs. It became the backbone of empire, lubricating the machinery of colonial capitalism. Yet beneath every tire, every belt, every gasket, there lies a story of stolen brilliance, a chemistry rooted in the hands of those who were denied even the right to claim it. When the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company was founded in 1898, it took its name not from the inventor himself, who died penniless, but from the legend of a discovery attributed to a white man. No one thought to honor the nameless chemists of color who first made rubber stable in the heat. To this day, fragments of their legacy survive in oral traditions. In parts of Bahia, Brazil, old communities of Afro-descendants still remember the rubber fires, where ancestors cured sap with smoke and sulfur-rich wood. In the American South, Remnants of recipes for waterproofing fabrics appear in 19th century black farming journals, referencing mixtures of gum tree sap and brimstone ash. These were not coincidences. They were echoes of a lost scientific tradition that colonial society refused to see. 
The rediscovery of this buried history challenges us to rethink what innovation truly means. It asks us to look beyond patents and laboratories to recognize that knowledge can exist outside the sanctioned halls of academia. It reminds us that enslaved Africans were not merely workers in the global economy. They were scientists, engineers, and inventors who shaped the material world in ways the modern world has yet to fully acknowledge. Their experiments with latex and sulfur were acts of resilience, ingenuity born from necessity and curiosity. And while the Goodyear narrative persists as a monument to industrial genius, the true story of rubber is far richer, more complex, and more human. In many ways, this forgotten chapter mirrors countless others in the long history of black innovation, from Benjamin Banneker's clocks to Granville Wood's telegraph improvements, from Sarah Boone's ironing board to Garrett Morgan's traffic signal. Each story reveals the same pattern, discovery, erasure, and eventual rediscovery. What makes the case of rubber especially poignant is that it sits at the crossroads of nature, labor, and empire, a material literally extracted from the sweat and intellect of colonized peoples, yet claimed by the colonizers as their own invention. As scholars continue to re-examine the archives of the early 19th century, more evidence emerges that challenges Goodyear's myth. Patent disputes in Britain and France from the 1840s contain references to prior experiments in the Caribbean. Letters from missionaries in Brazil describe black rubber makers who use volcanic ash to stabilize latex. Even Goodyear's own assistants admitted that their earliest samples came from South America, where the techniques were already perfected. It seems increasingly clear that Goodyear's real achievement was not invention, but appropriation. History has a way of favoring those who write it, and in the world of invention, that often means those who could afford to patent and publish. For the black chemists who discovered the secret of rubber long before Goodyear, their genius was lived, not written. It was preserved in smoke and sap, and the tactile wisdom passed from hand to hand. And while their names may have faded, the fruits of their labor continue to shape our modern lives on every road, in every engine, in every movement of the industrial world. It is time, at last, to remember them, not as footnotes in another man's story, but as the true chemists of rubber, whose discoveries were stolen, but whose legacy endures.